at your service. The coin telephone, used day and night by millions of people for business calls, personal calls, emergencies, for calls to everywhere about everything. In New York City alone, there are tens of thousands in stores, hotels, office buildings, railroad and subway stations, in public places of all sorts. Every day, well over two million coins are dropped into New York's public telephones. This steady accumulation of nickels, dimes and quarters must be kept moving to get back into circulation, or you and I might soon find ourselves without any small change. Let's see how this important task is handled. Collectors visit the thousands of telephones at intervals, carrying cases of empty coin receptacles to replace the filled ones. These visits require careful planning, for coin telephones in some locations fill up in a day or two, while in other locations it may take as much as a month or more. In making his rounds, the collector carries a large assortment of keys. They're carefully arranged in a route sequence that provides for the shortest travel with due regard for parking conditions, one-way streets, and other obstacles. He'd never get in without the right key because no two locks are alike, and the coins are safe behind tough steel plates. Also, each receptacle has a sealed cover which locks automatically. So the collector makes his rounds, filling several carrying cases with boxes of small change. The cases are unloaded at the nearest collection depot. They're heavy, holding on the average 60 pounds of coins. They're coming in steadily as many collectors return from their assignments. Here the cases and receptacles are checked in and the coins are sorted, counted, and prepared for prompt return to circulation. It's an efficiently organized process that's underway constantly in communities throughout America. And it's a big job, for over 20,000 tons of coins a year pass through the telephones of the Bell system. There are careful checks all along the line. The seals on the coin receptacles must remain unbroken up to the moment that they are turned over to the counters. With the aid of her machine, this young lady sorts and counts an average of 15,000 coins an hour. Each quarter diamond nickel with the rotation of the sorting wheel drops into its appointed slot. Meters record the count for each of the three denominations. With the coins adding up like this, it doesn't take long to fill the bags in which they'll be carried to the bank. Each bag holds 4,000 nickels, 4,000 quarters, or 10,000 dimes. And the machine stops at exactly that count to permit replacing a full bag with an empty one. To check the count, each bag is weighed. And if the weight is more than an ounce or two off standard, it's returned for a recount. Sealed into the bags, the coins are ready to return to circulation. In these piles are two tons two of the well over 20,000 tons which measure the annual talk of America over coin telephones of the Bell system. Every day, these tons of small change are taken to the banks on their way back to your pockets and mine, an essential part of the constant flow of money that keeps America running. The protruding forks of a small lifting truck slide into a double-faced wooden platform called a pallet, and the load is lifted and carried away. That's palletization, a $10 word that describes a highly efficient method of handling materials such as telephone supplies. Used with great success by our armed forces, the method was adopted by the alert engineers of the Western Electric Company, manufacturing branch of the Bell Telephone System, and now it's in use in most of the company's 28 distributing houses.
Mounted on a pallet, this telephone switchboard can be lifted, moved about, and set down anywhere in any position, high or low, ready for immediate shipment when needed. Palletization cuts down heavy physical effort and provides more space for moving, storing, and shipping the tremendous amount of telephone materials needed to meet the demand for more central offices, more switchboards, more cables, more telephones. These heavy coils of wire, each weighing about 200 pounds, need a different type of pallet and lifting truck. There are 15 or 1600 pounds in this load. Palletization is the means whereby these tools of the telephone trade are being handled faster and better than ever before. One more contribution to the endless effort to provide additional equipment and better telephone service wherever it is needed as quickly as possible. This tiny metal cylinder, three quarters of an inch long, is a transistor. Tiny though it is, it's hailed as a triumph of scientific achievement, for it will do a lot of big jobs, almost anything that an ordinary vacuum tube will do. The invention of the transistor is the product of industrial research of a very fundamental nature, directed toward a definite objective. Experiments such as these were frequent, involving hours of observation and study by Bell Laboratory scientists. Responsible for the invention are Dr. John Bardeen, Dr. Walter Bratton, and Dr. William Shockley, who directed this Bell Laboratories research program. Three physicists of special abilities and experience, each making an essential contribution to the discovery. And here is the result. A device, small indeed in comparison with this vacuum tube, yet capable of taking over its work. What's inside the transistor? Dr. Shockley shows us using a huge scale model. Inside are two pins supporting two fine spring wires which terminate in contact points. These points rest on a block of metallic substance known as germanium, which is soldered to a metal base. This model is 100 times actual size. The spring wires supported by the metal pins are only one thousandth of an inch in diameter. And the block on which the contact points rest isn't much larger than the head of a pin. A simple device with vast possibilities. The tiny transistors can entirely replace vacuum tubes and radios. Since there's no warming up period, the set plays instantly. And now let's see one of the ways the transistor could serve television. As everybody knows, the receiver must greatly amplify the television signal to produce a bright picture. For demonstration purposes, we have inserted this laboratory device, which can be adjusted to weaken the television signal to one hundredth of its strength. It makes the picture practically invisible. Now we add to the circuit another device, an amplifying unit using two transistors. With this booster operating to counteract the weakening effect of the other unit, the picture returns to full brilliance for the transistors amplify the television signal 100 times. Watch the difference as the booster is switched off and on. In telephony, millions of vacuum tubes in existing repeater stations and telephone offices throughout the nation strengthen your voice as it travels over long distance lines. Someday, transistors will be used for many telephone applications, including this important one of boosting the strength of your voice so that it may reach its destination regardless of distance. An entirely new physical principle has come to light with the invention of the transistor, a new servant of mankind. <laughs>